we need to be cognizant of their limitations and aware of ways in which the hallmark paradigm might actually be counterproductive. If you can prevent that increase in mitochondrial dysfunction, you can have positive impacts on lifespan and health span metrics. It is possible to partially restore function in certain organs and tissues. I could no longer ignore the fact that chronic sterile inflammation is a key driver of many functional declines and diseases that go along with aging. These lifestyle changes can have such a profound effect on the overall aging process. My name is Matt Caberlein and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. On today's episode in the science of longevity, we're gonna do sort of a shallow dive into the hallmarks of aging. I promise we won't get too deep. Um, in future episodes, we'll really take a closer look at each individual hallmark. But the goal today is really just to present the hallmarks of aging, give you a feel for what they are, how they sort of came about, how they've evolved, um, and some of the impacts that the hallmarks paradigm has had on the field of longevity. So I think one thing that is useful for people to appreciate um, is that the hallmarks are actually pretty new. So the first paper describing the hallmarks of aging, which went, went by that title, was published in 2013. So really it's only been a little more than 10 years that the hallmarks of aging has even existed. And, and that's a blink of an eye in the timescale of, of the development of a scientific field. So um, it's sort of useful to appreciate how much the hallmarks paradigm has come to really dominate the field of aging biology or, or, or geroscience or longevity, however you wanna to refer to it, um, in such a short period of time. And I'll come back to that idea of, you know, what are some of the impacts of how dominant the Hallmarks paradigm really has become. Um, it's also use, useful to appreciate that the Hallmarks are evolving. So the first paper was published in 2013 that had nine Hallmarks of aging. Uh, paper was published last year. So really on the, like the 10 year anniversary that added three more Hallmarks of aging. And I expect, you know, we'll have more in the future. So what I wanna do today is really walk through the Hallmarks of aging and give you some insights into to what these things actually are. And I guess I would sort of start by defining the hallmarks as kind of consensus uh, aspects of biological aging that really seem to be shared across the animal kingdom. And there are really three criteria that have been put forth for defining a new hallmark of aging. One is age-associated manifestation. And, and what that means is that the hallmark um, is associated with aging across the animal kingdom in pretty much every individual uh, as that individual ages. The second criteria is that increasing a hallmark should accelerate biological aging. And the third criteria, which is sort of the inverse of that, is that decreasing a hallmark should slow, and the authors also use the language in parentheses, or reverse biological aging. Um, and so the, those are really the three things that in principle need to be true in order to define something as a hallmark of aging. Um, I think there's still a fair amount of ambiguity around that. There are probably things that fit these three criteria that have not yet been defined as a hallmark of aging. And, you know, you could make some arguments, I think, that some of the existing hallmarks, the extent to which they really meet these three criteria from an experimental perspective also is a little bit am ambiguous and maybe, you know, some of them, I, I guess, I think it's fair to say have been better documented to meet these three criteria than others. So again, that's how we define a hallmark. I think it's important to appreciate this really needs to be true across a broad evolutionary distance and the four common model organisms that have been used most frequently in biomedical research in the field of uh, aging biology are budding yeast, nematode worms, fruit flies, and mice. Not all of these hallmarks are going to necessarily be relevant in all of these organisms, but in general, we expect a hallmark of aging to be broadly evolutionarily conserved. Um, okay, so let's start again with uh, uh, thinking a little bit more about these three criteria. The first one, age-associated manifestation. I think it's pretty clear why 
meeting this criterion is not sufficient to define something as a hallmark of aging, but it's probably worth thinking about this explicitly. So I think we could all come up with lots of um, lots of traits that show an age-associated manifestation that are not directly related to the biology of aging intrinsically. So things like hair graying, skin wrinkling, sensory loss, declines in walking speed, all of those show age-associated manifestation, but none of them are clearly going to meet the other criteria of accelerating those hallmarks accelerates all of biological aging or decelerating those hallmarks slows down or decelerates all of biological aging. So there are lots of things that change with age that could in fact be caused by the hallmarks of aging in many cases, but are not actually fundamental features of biological aging that everyone experiences that contributes to the underlying functional declines and diseases of old age at an organismal level. But I think it's also useful to appreciate you know, why this can be ambiguous. So I think those traits that I just mentioned pretty obviously don't meet these other criteria. But what about things like muscle or bone loss or declines in VO2 max um, or organ and tissue level dysfunction, kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, loss of blood brain barrier or obesity? I think you can make a case that all of these in principle, accelerate at least some aspects of biological aging, and that if we fix these things or prevent them from happening, they might actually decelerate some aspects of organismal biological aging. Um, so where you draw the line, and, and none of these are hallmarks of aging, at least the current set of hallmarks of aging. So where you draw that line, I think, is perhaps a little bit ambiguous in some cases. Um, and this has led, among other things, to, I think, some criticisms of the hallmarks. So one of the criticisms is that um, they're somewhat arbitrary, as I've sort of already alluded to. Another criticism is that they're incomplete. And I don't think any, I don't know that that's really a fair criticism. I think scientific models will always be incomplete. They'll always be somewhat inaccurate. Um, but clearly they are incomplete. And, and, you know, the fact that three new hallmarks were added last year is pretty good evidence for that. Um, another criticism is, you know, do all of the hallmarks have human relevance? I, again, I'm not sure that's a particularly valid criticism because in many ways it's difficult to prove, right, that decelerating a hallmark is going to decelerate human aging because nobody's done those experiments, right? To actually show a deceleration of human aging would take decades, really, to show that formally right now. So so I think you can, you can make an argument that not all of the hallmarks have been equally demonstrated to play a role in human aging, but I, I don't really think it's fair to say that because we haven't shown that a hallmark slows human aging, that that's, you know, a, a valid criticism of the hallmark per se. Another criticism is the interconnectivity or redundancy among the hallmarks. I'll come back to that. I think that's, that is absolutely true. The hallmarks are interconnected. Again, I don't know that that's a fair criticism. I think that really reflects the biological nature of aging. Um, and so I would argue that, you know, the hallmarks are limited, but useful, and that they are, in fact, a useful construct. They have been quite useful to the field, but I would also suggest that we need to be um, cognizant of their limitations and aware of ways in which the hallmark paradigm might actually be counterproductive. And I do think there are some ways that the hallmarks paradigm has been counterproductive to the field. Okay, so with that, without further ado, let's take a look at the 2024 edition of the Hallmarks of Aging. And I thought what I would do is just kind of go through this list and give very brief descriptions of what this actually means. I'm going to try to do it in a way that doesn't require a PhD in biology. So hopefully I'm successful. Okay, so we'll start with genomic instability. And this just really refers to the fact that um, with age, again, in every organism that we have studied, there are changes in the structure of the genome. The genome is the DNA that encodes all of the genes that make an animal into that animal or that in individual. So the nucleotide bases that are, that are uh, linked together to make up your genome. And what we know is that there are a variety of different ways that the genome can degrade with age. That could be point mutations. These could be larger sorts of genomic uh, rearrangements. Um, but it is a fundamental feature of aging that we see genomic instability and degradation of the 
genome sequence degrade with age. And again, there's evidence for all of these hallmarks that accelerating that genomic instability or uh, can accelerate aspects of biological aging, certainly shorten lifespan, and decelerating genomic instability can slow down the biological aging process. I would argue for genomic instability, the evidence that decelerating genomic instability can positively influence biological aging is a little bit weaker than for some of the other hallmarks, but you can certainly find evidence in the literature to support that. Hallmark number two is telomere attrition. And so telomeres are referred to often as the caps at the end of the genomic sequence. So our genome is packaged into a set of chromosomes. Chromosomes are part of the genome. And when you put all of the chromosomes together, you will get the entire genome of the organism. Different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes, but at the end of these chromosomes, which are, you can, if you think about it as a, if you stretch out the genome sequence into this linear sort of structure, at the ends of the chromosomes are these caps called telomeres. And we need telomeres on the ends of our chromosomes because if we don't have them, um, it becomes very challenging to replicate the chromosomes for cells to divide and maintain their genome integrity. So that's really what the chromosomes are for. They kind of protect the ends of the chromosomes and allow um, the entire genome to be copied with every cell division. Now, what we know is that with age, the lengths of these telomeres get shorter. And again, that has to do with the replication challenges that go along with replicating a linear molecule. So they get shorter with each subsequent cell division. And at some point, the telomeres become so short that they are recognized as a specific type of DNA damage called a double strand break. So this is a link between telomere shortening and DNA damage. There's a connection there. Um, there are also proteins on the end of the telomeres that become dysregulated as telomeres become shorter. So probably the combination of both of those things creates uh, challenges for the cell to continue functioning. And again, across the animal kingdom, we see telomere shortening as a feature of biological aging. We know that if you accelerate telomere shortening, you can accelerate some aspects of biological aging. And there's evidence in a few organisms, and in mice in particular, that if we lengthen telomeres or prevent them from shortening, we can actually increase lifespan and delay some aspects of aging. Okay, so that's hallmark number two. So hallmark number three is epigenetic alterations. And so first of all, it's useful just to appreciate um, epigenetic just refers to anything that is sort of on top of the genome that is affecting the way the genome is expressed. So again, going back to sort of high school biology, there's DNA in the genome, that gets turned into RNA, and then RNA gets translated into proteins, and it's in general, the proteins that do a lot of the work in carrying out chemical reactions, which then those chemical reactions affect the metabolites, the metabolome um, in your body. So that step going from DNA to RNA and then RNA to protein, there's regulation that occurs at both of those steps that fall under this heading of epigenetic alteration. So it's not a change in the DNA sequence, it's a change in how that sequence is turned into the work that the cell needs to do. And so there are a variety of types of epigenetic regulation. Um, the type that has a has sort of received the most attention in the field over the last several years and has really become one of the most prominent um, hallmarks of aging is a specific type of epigenetic regulation called methylation. So if you have heard of epigenetic clocks, and sometimes these are mis- um, termed biological aging clocks, really what they're measuring is one specific type of epigenetic regulation that changes with age that appears to be particularly important for controlling which genes are expressed as we get older. And um, most people would argue uh, is causal for dysregulation of gene expression, which is then going to lead to dysregulation of protein expression and all of the downstream consequences of that. So epigenetic alterations, again, are characteristic changes that go along with aging. They seem to actually be shared pretty broadly across the animal kingdom, which has allowed for some of these pan-mammalian 
epigenetic aging clocks. So there are similar changes in the epigenome with age. I think one of the more intriguing hypotheses that has been put forth is that epigenetic alterations are, are sort of, you know, higher, if you were to, to rank the hallmarks hierarchically, kind of at the top of that ranking. And if we could fix these epigenetic alterations, we would have outsized impact on the biology of aging. And that's where this idea of epigenetic reprogramming comes into and potentially functional and maybe molecular rejuvenation of tissues and organs. And I'd say it's still very early. We really don't know how effective those sorts of approaches are going to be in the context of aging, but it's an intriguing hypothesis and I think a pretty exciting area of uh, research in the field. Okay. That's uh, epigenetic alterations. Uh, hallmark number four is loss of proteostasis. So proteostasis just refers to the appropriate structure and function of proteins. So with age, we know that there is a loss of structure and function for many proteins. Uh, you've probably heard of protein misfolding or protein aggregation. Certainly you have heard of plaques and tangles in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So those are examples of failures in proteostasis, proteins no longer functioning the way they're supposed to or maintaining their appropriate structure. And again, like all the hallmarks, there's evidence that if we can uh, prevent loss of protein homeostasis, we can dramatically improve metrics of health span and lifespan. And if we accelerate loss of protein homeostasis, we can accelerate biological aging. I haven't touched on this yet, probably worth mentioning. When you think about different animal models that are commonly studied in biomedical research, the evidence for and against different hallmarks of aging is stronger or weaker in different animal models. And so this, I think, is a useful example where I think with confidence, I can say when we think about Sanorhabditis elegans, the nematode worm, again, one of the most common model organisms used, C. elegans aging seems to be particularly sensitive to loss of proteostasis, probably more sensitive than other organisms. Whereas if we go back to say telomere attrition, telomere attrition probably isn't important at all for aging in C. elegans or budding yeast, but appears to be more important for aging in mammals like mice, potentially people as well. So it's just useful to appreciate that while all of the hallmarks, I think you can find evidence that they could play a role in across the animal kingdom. Some of them are more or less important in different species um, as, again, we look across the animal kingdom, which does raise the question whether or not as we look at more animals, because there are a lot of animals that haven't been really studied at all, will we find new hallmarks that we didn't really appreciate? I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, um, sort of related to proteostasis in a sense, the next hallmark is disabled macroautophagy. So um, autophagy is commonly referred to as the recycling center of the cell. And so the idea here is that, you know, there are all sorts of cellular processes that are happening all the time. We're building new molecules and there are often cases where we build molecules for a specific purpose but we don't need those molecules anymore. And rather than just have them sit around or have them you know, excreted out of the cell, the cell will break those complicated structures back down into their building blocks so that those building blocks can be recycled. It's a more efficient way of partitioning energy to reuse some of these building blocks as opposed to synthesizing them from scratch. So macroautophagy is the primary process by which the cell will break down things that it doesn't need anymore. The cell will also degrade damaged molecules that have accumulated through macroautophagy. And again, one of the things that has been observed is that with age, there is a decline in the function of this recycling center. It doesn't work as well. And the mechanisms there are you know, fairly well understood. And again, in different organisms, there's pretty good evidence that if we, if we artificially impair mac macroautophagy, we can accelerate some aspects of biological aging. And if we can enhance macroautophagy, we can increase lifespan and improve some of the metrics of health span. And again, I think C. elegans is probably the example where there's the most evidence for a very important role of macroautophagy. Now, I mentioned this was somewhat related to proteostasis. One of the things that macroautophagy does is it 
degrades damaged and misfolded proteins. So, so again, this is another connection between two of the hallmarks of aging. And as we'll see in a minute, these connections are sort of all over the place around, around the hallmarks. Another thing that might be worth mentioning here is that macroautophagy is one of the one of a few key processes that are regulated by mTOR. mTOR is, of course, the mechanistic target of rapamycin. We've talked about the drug rapamycin. So one of the ways by which turning down mTOR probably increases lifespan, and this has been clearly demonstrated in, in C. elegans, uh, is through an upregulation of macroautophagy when we turn down mTOR with something like rapamycin. Um, and that's going to connect now to the next hallmark of aging, which is deregulated nutrient signaling. So this is the hallmark where things like mTOR, insulin IGF-1 signaling, growth hormone live. These are processes, pathways that help sense the environment and then manage the cell's response to the environment, particularly nutritional status in the environment. And so from a very basic perspective, one way to think about this is when there's lots of nutrients around, lots of food in the environment, that from an evolutionary perspective is a good time to grow rapidly and reproduce, right? It makes sense to have babies when there's food in the environment to feed them. When there's not very much nutrients available in the environment, that's a really bad time to grow and reproduce. And so that tends to turn down these nutrient signaling pathways like mTOR, like IGF-1, like insulin signaling. And what's been observed again is that with aging, Again, across all of the model organisms that are studied, there's a deregulation of this signaling process and pathways. So for example, mTOR hyperactivation with age, or maybe I should say inappropriate activity level with age appears to be a common feature. And by turning down these nutrient signaling pathways across every model organism where this has been studied, you can increase lifespan and improve health span metrics. Um, so, but this again ties back to macroautophagy because one of the things that turning down nutrient signaling does is to turn up macroautophagy. Okay. The next hallmark of aging, uh, this is one of my personal favorites, is mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, you probably have heard of mitochondria described as the powerhouses of the cell. Uh, mitochondria do a lot of other things as well, but they are critically important for um, generating ATP, which is the currency of the cell for uh, carrying out chemical reactions. And so again, what has been observed across every model system where this has been studied is with age, dramatic increase in dysfunctional mitochondria. And there are now multiple examples where if you can prevent that increase in mitochondrial dysfunction, you can have positive impacts on lifespan and health span metrics. Mitochondrial dysfunction, I think, is a pretty interesting hallmark in part because in many ways, similar to epigenetic alterations, you can find evidence in the literature connecting mitochondrial dysfunction with all of the other hallmarks of aging. So to some extent, you might think of mitochondrial dysfunction as a potential core hallmark that is perhaps driving some of the downstream dysfunction in the other hallmarks of aging. All right, so what are we on? That is hallmark number seven. Hallmark number eight is cellular senescence. So cellular senescence uh, refers to the process by which cells stop doing their job. Basically, that's one way to think of it, right? So if you have all of the cells in our body have jobs to do, uh, and cells, for a variety of reasons, can become dysfunctional and stop doing their jobs well. When that happens, there are multiple pathways that cells can go down when they become sufficiently dysfunctional. One pathway is apoptosis, that's programmed cell death. So it makes sense from a biological perspective, if you've got cells that are non-functional, that if you can get rid of those cells, that that would be a potentially a good thing um, and allow those cells to be replaced by functional cells. So that's one pathway cells can go down. Another pathway cells can go down is cancer, right? So cells that stop doing their job and even worse, they start dividing uncontrollably become cancer. So apoptosis is one of the key mechanisms by which the cell, by which the organism prevents cancer, because if the cell dies, it can't go on to become a cancer. The other way we can prevent cancer from a biological perspective is this senescence pathway. So cellular senescence, those cells don't die, 
but they also shut off cell division. So this is a way to keep cells from becoming cancers because the brakes are basically permanently put on the cell division machinery. So these cells kind of sit around and that wouldn't be a problem, right? It probably isn't such a big deal if you just have dysfunctional cells sitting there not doing anything. The problem with senescent cells is that they give off a variety of signals that cause the cells and tissues around them to become dysfunctional or at least contribute to dysfunction in those cells. This is called the SASP or senescence associated secretory phenotype. So there's a whole bunch of molecules that have been found to be secreted by senescent cells. Many of them are pro-inflammatory, so it's believed that the accumulation of senescent cells drives much of the chronic inflammation that goes along with aging. Um, and so there's a variety of literature now showing that not only do senescent cells accumulate, but if we can clear those senescent cells, we can have positive impacts on health span, probably lifespan, although I would say the lifespan data is somewhat mixed. So it's it, it has not been completely consistent that people are able to see lifespan increases, at least in mice, from clearing senescent cells. You may have heard the term senolytic. So senolytics are therapeutics that in principle can kill senescent cells and should be specific for senescent cells. A couple of things to appreciate about cellular senescence. Um, I think we're learning that cellular senescence is not one thing. It's sort of a catch-all term for cells that become dysfunctional, don't die, but also stop dividing in many, many different tissues. And senescent cells in the liver are probably very different from senescent cells in the muscle or in the brain. And, and it's probably even more complicated than that. So there are many, many different flavors of cellular senescence um, that we're really just starting to learn about. Um, and I think this has made it challenging to create very effective senolytics because there may not be one strategy that is useful for targeting and killing senescent cells throughout the entire body. So this is an active area of research. This is one area that impinges on multiple age-related diseases directly. So there's a lot of interest both among the geroscience community, but also among disease-specific researchers at understanding the role of senescent cells in a variety of age-related diseases. Okay, uh, the next hallmark is stem cell exhaustion. This is pretty straightforward. So everybody probably is familiar with the idea that we have stem cells throughout our bodies that help to um, repopulate uh, tissues and organs with new cells when uh, dysfunctional cells become damaged and die or are no longer doing their jobs. We need the stem cells to keep our organs and tissues functioning. Um, as we get older, again, it has been established uh, in many different animals that stem cells appear to become depleted. They no longer uh, replenish as well as they used to, and they no longer function as well as they used to. I think the thing that's important to appreciate about stem cell exhaustion is that it's probably a combination of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that are driving stem cell exhaustion. So there's damage within the stem cells themselves, things like uh, genome damage or disabled macroautophagy or loss of proteostasis. That's all happening within the stem cells themselves. But there's also the environment that the stem cells are residing in that probably drives a lot of the stem cell dysfunction that goes along with age. And I alluded to chronic inflammation, perhaps as a result of uh, cellular senescence. So when stem cells are residing in a chronically inflamed environment, that also impairs them from doing their jobs and replenishing tissues and organs. And one of the things I think that has emerged in the literature is that if we can take if we can take therapeutic strategies to reduce that chronic inflammation, like for example, clearing senescent cells or treatments like rapamycin, you can then potentially restore the function, at least partially, of the existing stem cells to a much higher level than they were functioning at in that chronic inflamed environment. This also ties into the idea of stem cell therapies as useful regenerative therapies in the context of aging. There's some literature to support that. I would say that's pretty weak at this point. I personally absolutely believe 
that it is possible to partially restore function in certain organs and tissues through stem cell therapies. Um, but I haven't yet seen a lot of data that convinces me that this is really ready for human application. Um, and really, I think this is a place where I would personally like to see more very well-documented human studies showing um, functional rejuvenation from stem cell therapies. Um, okay, the next hallmark of aging, we're on number 10 now, uh, is altered intercellular communication. And so this really just refers to the way that cells in our bodies communicate, talk to each other. So the authors of the Hallmarks of Aging paper talk about neuronal, neuroendocrine, and hormonal as examples of altered intercellular communication. But this goes way beyond just those categories to all sorts of different um, ways that the the communication between cells in our bodies become impaired with age. Again, you can also see how this ties in with other hallmarks. If we're talking about changes in hormonal signaling, that goes back to deregulated nutrient signaling, things like growth hormone and IGF-1. And of course, everybody is familiar with the idea that there are significant hormonal changes that go along with human aging that contribute to functional declines and diseases of aging in people. Okay. Hallmark number 11, I've alluded to already a couple of times, chronic inflammation. Um, this is one that I have become quite a convert uh, to believe in. Um, for much of my career working in invertebrate models, I really tried to avoid the immune system. It seemed very complicated. Um, it is very complicated. Uh, but you know, it got to a point where I could no longer ignore the fact that chronic sterile inflammation is a key driver of many functional declines and diseases that go along with aging, um, certainly in, in mammals. And I really think this is one of the most important hallmarks kind of at the, again, if we're thinking about this as a hierarchy from cause, you know, to disease, uh, driving disease, you know, you might put chronic inflammation kind of down closer to driving disease that is being, and the reason why there's so much chronic inflammation is because of some of the other hallmarks like genomic instability and epigenetic alterations and mitochondrial dysfunction and cellular senescence and deregulated nutrient sensing are all contributing to this chronic inflammatory state. And um, if any of you have heard of inflammaging, uh, that term refers to the idea that aging is largely driven by this increase in chronic inflammation. Okay, and last but not least, hallmark number 12 is dysbiosis. And so this is one of the new hallmarks. And this refers to the idea that the microbial communities in our body become dysregulated with age. Um, the authors of the Hallmarks paper were primarily thinking of the gut microbiome, but of course we have other microbial communities in our body, the oral microbiome, the skin microbiome, the vaginal microbiome. Um, I think there's evidence that all of these microbial communities become dysregulated with age and to differing extents may contribute causally to, again, some of the functional declines and diseases that go along with aging certainly can contribute to other hallmarks of aging. Um, again, as an example, there's growing evidence that gut dysbiosis can contribute to chronic inflammation um, uh, and to inflammaging in general. And so um, I think, again, you know, this is still pretty early. I think we're really learning more and more about how the microbial communities change with age, the interaction between these microbial communities and the immune system, and the way that they're modulating inflammatory signaling and other types of signaling in the body, but clearly key contributors to the biological aging process in some way. But again, I think it's still pretty murky exactly what those mechanistic connections are between the microbiome, microbiomes and biological aging. Okay, so that was a fairly shallow, believe it or not, dive into the hallmarks of aging. Um, one of the points I wanna make that I've kind of mentioned a couple of times is how interconnected these hallmarks are. And so, uh, so in the center of this graphic, you'll see that I have drawn arrows between the hallmarks. This is probably not all of the arrows that you could draw, but this is sort of my view if we look at the literature of where it's clear that one hallmark is playing a causal role to the uh, accumulation of another hallmark. And I hope what you can appreciate is there's a lot of connections. 
And I think what this illustrates is that there's a network underlying the hallmarks of aging that we really don't understand very well. And I think you can think about this network in a variety of ways. You can think about it as interacting proteins and metabolites and RNAs. That's kind of the way I think about it from a molecular biologist perspective. And if you think about it that way, then it becomes pretty clear that we know what a few nodes in this network are, things like mTOR and AMP kinase and FOXO and growth hormone, IGF-1, and there's a few others. Um, but we really don't know how those pieces are interacting in a very detailed way and what a lot of the other players in this network are. And so I think it's fair to say that, you know, we have pretty poorly defined at this point exactly what this network looks like. But we do know what some of the nodes are that seem to be particularly amenable to tweaking. And by tweaking, I mean we have ways, either through genetic strategies or through small molecules or through dietary interventions, to change the activity of those nodes. And we know that by doing so, we can have impacts on not only one hallmark of aging, but many hallmarks of aging. And in some cases, all of the hallmarks of aging, which is how this network is sort of connecting the hallmarks of aging. So at least that's the way I think about the underlying network below the hallmarks. Um, another point that I like to make, and I know this frustrates some of my colleagues, um, but I think it's important to appreciate how rudimentary our understanding of biological aging is today. It's certainly better than it was 30 years ago. No question about it. We've made huge strides in our mechanistic understanding of the biology of aging. But at least from my perspective, there's still way more that we don't understand than we do understand. And so one of the ways that I illustrate this in my, my public talks sometimes is to compare our understanding of biological aging to the representation of the map of the earth in 500 BC. So this is Hecatus's map. And um, you can see that on this map, there's sort of a kind of a Europe-shaped Europe and a not very Asia-shaped Asia and an outsized Libya and an ocean. And if you sail too far across the ocean, you fall off the edge of the earth. Now, I'm not sure that our understanding of aging is quite that rudimentary, but it's probably not too far off. The other point I want to make, though, and why I kind of like this analogy is this was still a pretty darn useful map in 500 BC. So even though it's not at all a very good representation of what the surface of the Earth actually looks like from our perspective now, people could use this map to do some pretty cool stuff at that time. And I think we can use the hallmarks of aging to do some pretty cool stuff today. In principle, targeting those hallmarks individually or simultaneously can positively impact health span metrics and potentially lifespan in people. And that's important. And so I don't want to diminish the value of the hallmarks today, but I do think it is important to appreciate how much we don't understand about biological aging. And part of the reason why I think this is important is because I do feel like the field has become perhaps way too narrow in part because of the dominance of the Hallmarks paradigm. Um, I think this was unanticipated when the Hallmarks of Aging were first presented, but in my experience, it be, has become very difficult to do research and particularly to get funding for research that looks outside the Hallmarks paradigm. And I think that is one of the challenges that the field faces today. And I would argue that it perhaps is part of the reason why the impact of new interventions that have been discovered is diminishing. And that's just the data. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical necessarily of the work that's going on in the field. I think we need these you know, very detailed mechanistic studies, but it is simply a fact that we are not finding new interventions that have larger effect sizes than what we've known about for 20, 30, 40 years. You can just look at the data, right? The best we've been able to do in the lab is an experiment that was done by Rick Weindrick and Roy Walford 30 years ago in mice with caloric restriction, where they showed that you could increase lifespan from a single intervention by 60% from caloric restriction. And if you look in the literature, nothing that has been done, certainly in the last 10 years, and I don't think since this experiment was done, with the exception maybe of some of the genetic tweaks that 
act on the same signaling pathways during development, nothing is this big in terms of effects on lifespan in mammals. And so I think it's a valuable question to ask, why aren't we finding new interventions, maybe not on a weekly basis, but at least on a yearly basis, that are better than something that was done 30 years ago? Um, and I think the narrowness of the field is part of the reason why that's happening. And I would point out that if you just look across nature, nature can do way better than 60%, right? If we look from short-lived animals like nematode worms and flies that live for a month to a few months to moderately long-lived animals, maybe dogs or people, to very, very long-lived animals like some whales or clams that can live centuries, Mother Nature has figured out how to modify the rate of aging by orders of magnitude more than what we've been able to achieve in the lab. And so I think this is clear evidence that there's a lot we still don't understand about the biology of aging. And we should be studying outside of the hallmarks in case the answers lie outside of the hallmarks. So, um, so that's my sort of perspective on, on one of the limitations um, of the hallmarks of aging as they exist today. So my advice would be, as a field, let's stay humble, let's not assume that we know it all, and let's get to work, because there's a lot clearly to be figured out. And so with that, I just want to finish up with one final observation, and this will lead into an episode that will be coming up in the near future where I start to talk about the OptiSpan philosophy of healthspan medicine. And um, if you think about, you know, healthspan, there are a variety of different ways that people represent healthspan uh, or healthspan medicine, a variety of different pillars that different groups have come up with. At OptiSpan, we've sort of settled on four pillars, but I recognize you could have any number of pillars you want. Um, our pillars are really focused around eat, so nutrition, move, exercise, sleep, sleep, and connect. And connect captures both your sort of individual mindfulness connection to the world around you and your connection to other human beings, potentially companion animals as well. And the point I'm making with the pillars in the context of the hallmarks of aging is that I think we all know that these pillars have an impact on health and they can impact multiple age-related diseases, right? No question about that. Um, and it's my belief that from a biological perspective, and again, I think there's pretty good biological evidence to support this, that the reason that the pillars of health span impact overall health, age-related disease, mortality risk, is because they're acting biologically on that underlying network that we represent currently as the hallmarks of aging. I just think that's something useful for people to appreciate. That's the reason why I believe these lifestyle changes can have such a profound effect on the overall aging process. Okay, so hopefully uh, this has been informative. Uh, you now have a better understanding of the hallmarks of aging, what they are, how they're defined, how they came about, and maybe some of the limitations of the current hallmarks of aging paradigm. So thank you for watching. Uh, as always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you like this content, please subscribe to the OptiSpan YouTube channel, and I will see you next time when we start to introduce the concept of healthspan medicine.